So I'd like to next, next introduce uh, Dr. Anu Agarwal, who's been uh, in the Microphotonics Center at MIT um, since 1994 with a brief stint out in industry. Um, in addition to what she's going to share, share with us today on uh, MIDIR Silicon Photonics Sensing Platform, uh, one of the things that we imagine Sense.Nano will be doing is looking at uh, a broad technology roadmap uh, amongst the areas on which we're going to focus. What are the grand challenge areas and how do we get to where we are 5, 10, 20 years from now? Uh, Anu is leading that effort right now uh, as a committee doing that in photonic sensors. So um, that's not what she's going to be talking about today, but I uh, wanted to make sure that you know that it's happened. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Just a brief show of hands. How many of you have a sensor with you today? Great. <laughs> the right answer. <laughs> not just one, but maybe 14 or 15 of them. Motion sensor, light sensor, heat sensor, what have you. If you have a cell phone, you have it all. So we have smartphones. We also have smart homes. And the reason is, we have all these sensors that are built into our homes that tell us about smoke, heat, light, motion. Moreover, these are sensors that are remote. And so you can be sitting right here and know what's going on in your home. I'd like to focus on the global photonics sensor market for a minute. It's a 15 billion market by 2020, that's the projection. And if you look at this chart, it looks busy, but I'd like to bring your attention to say this right corner box. It tells me that photonic sensors are most used in Europe. The center middle box tells me that the most common type of photonic sensors are used by military and homeland security. This little box in the corner here tells me that photonic sensors have taken an upswing. Why? Because of certain impacting factors, least of not which is increase in wireless technology, as well as a need to move out of the conventional space for sensing. So I'd like to focus my talk on what we do here in the lab, which is integrated photonic sensors. Roughly speaking, that's what an integrated photonic sensor is. Here I show you a waveguide that's on a pedestal. And it interacts with analytes around it. As light goes through it, it changes its properties. And what we monitor is that change. As people have talked about before, and as uh, the, our keynote speaker this morning mentioned, <clears throat> Applications are what drive sensors or what should drive sensors. So here I'm just showing you brief applications in the Internet of Things, also in industry, food and water quality monitoring, as was discussed earlier, oil and gas industry, car industry, medical technology, also, most importantly, in homeland security and military, after what we heard about went on in Manchester. So all of these applications are what should drive our fabrication or sensing um, community, which it does. What is our platform? What is it that we're bringing to the table? Well, that's what it is, the MIT-IR silicon sensor platform for sensing. I do this work at the Microphotonics Center, part of the AIM Photonics Institute, and we work closely with Professor Jujin Hu and Professor Kimmerling, both residing in the material science and engineering department, and a whole team of students, as uh, Tim Swager pointed out, an army of students who make all this work happen. One of the students um, will be showing a poster this um, afternoon. So there's our platform. It's a sensor. And it is a sensor chip that has all the ingredients. If you're talking about photonic sensors, you need to have first a light source on the chip, which we show here. The light from that source has to travel through waveguides and reach the sensing element, which is the place where all the interactions happen. The chemicals interact with your light. 
and the changed signals caused by the interaction reaches the photodetector up there. And the photodetector gives you a signal, which is either a photovoltage signal or a photocurrent signal. And that is read by the underlying integrated circuits. And we've actually shown that we can make all these readout integrated circuits and build our photonics on top, much like Max had shown earlier today. What do we do with the data? Well, we need to use RFIDs, just like Tim said, and send them all over and build a connectivity, sensor connectivity um, area. What kind of material are we planning to use or did we decide to use? Well, we decided to use glass on silicon. Not the standard glass that you see in window panes, but specialty glasses, which are calcogenides. And these calcogenide glasses replace oxygen with sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, and a whole bunch of other elements in the periodic table, gallium, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and so on. Now, why did we go through this trouble to go and look in the periodic table and find this group of elements? Simply because when you're doing photonic sensing, and particularly integrated photonic sensing, you need to find materials that are transparent in the region that you're trying to sense. Here, you can see that the calcogenides are transparent across a wide region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Specifically, the functional group region and the fingerprint region. These are important because most chemical molecules have their vibrations in that region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you're trying to do any kind of spectroscopy, you need to be able to access that region, which is why we chose these glasses. One more reason why we chose it, tunable optical properties. We can actually modify the composition, the stoichiometry, in any way possible based on the elements that we pick. And that allows us to make our integrated photonic sensors more flexible. Ease of fabrication, I can show you that we use simple liftoff fabrication where you have almost everybody's probably used it. You have light shining through a mask on a photoresist. You develop it, you deposit your glass, and you lift off your resist, and voila, there are your devices right there. Here I show you a calcogenide glass micro disc. What do we do with these devices? Well, we use it to sense a liquid, N-methylaniline, in carbon tetrachloride, as an example. There's the transmittance spectrum showing you the black dots are with just carbon tetrachloride alone. And then when you add N-methylaniline to the carbon tetrachloride, you see the red dots. So there's the signal that we are monitoring. Not just that, if you change the concentration of N-methylaniline, you can see that the optical absorption increases. Therefore, what we've shown practically is on-chip absorption spectroscopy to detect liquid N-methylaniline. How about gas sensing? This is something that's very important today, especially as we are wondering about pollution in the environment. Well, we've demonstrated methane gas sensing on chip. And the device that we've used for this, the integrated photonic device that we've used is a spiral. The reason for using the spiral is that now you have a larger path length for interaction with your target chemical. Again, here's the transmittance spectrum. You see that at about 3310 nanometer, there's a dip. This corresponds to absorption by the methane molecules. And again, as we saw in the case of N-methylaniline liquid, in this case, as you increase the methane concentration, you see that transmittance drops. So absorption has actually increased. So we've shown on-chip methane gas detection. Now, what about detection? Actual detection. We use lead telluride integrated with calcogenide glass waveguides. Why do we go through this trouble? Well, you'll see in a minute. <coughs> this picture here shows you our waveguide with two arms. And one arm is for alignment. The other arm has a detector material underneath with metal contacts to collect 
the photo signal. Here's a microscope image of that exact same structure of a waveguide integrated with a detector. And you can see that the region of integration is a very smooth area. There's no loss there, no scattering. As JJ pointed out earlier today, waveguide integration with detectors helps noise suppression. And it's a very basic IR photonic circuit that we can demonstrate. That'll be to our advantage if we can put it all together and integrate it. How does that detector perform? Well, here's what you see is a photocurrent as a function of the power coupled to our detector through our waveguide. And you can see that there's a nice linear response over a large wavelength range that we measured it. And here's the key takeaway. When we integrate a waveguide with a detector, we suppress the noise, responsivity goes up by almost two orders of magnitude. So does external quantum efficiency. And the icing on the cake, really, is the fact that we can actually detect at room temperature. We don't have to go to cryogenic temperatures. Not even thermoelectric cooling is necessary. And this is pretty remarkable for something that has such a small band gap that goes out into the mid-infrared. Can we do something different with these detector materials? The answer is yes. We've actually put these lead telluride materials into a resonant cavity structure at low enough temperature. And here's the picture of it. It's a schematic on the right side and the actual SEM image of the fabricated structure right next to it. It shows that we have a top mirror, a bottom mirror, and lead telluride in between. What this does is that when light comes down into your sample, you find that light bounces back and forth. First of all, you only pick a certain region of the light to go through. And that light bounces back and forth several times between the top and bottom mirrors, causing a large amount of absorption in even a thin layer of your detector. And there is the actual performance. Reflectance is a function of wavelength. The small region we've picked for transmittance is the region around the 3,500 nanometer wavelength range. And the rest of it is reflected. So we make what's called a photonic band gap. And in that resonant cavity mode is where we are trying to detect. Curiously, when we just put our metal electrodes on either side of our lead telluride, we get a signal that you can see with the open circles. But when you actually put it within this resonant cavity that I was talking about, you get a 14 times enhanced signal at the wavelength of interest that it was designed for. So we end up measuring about 100 volts per watt with this kind of structure. So this is all good. What if we want to go further into the infrared and we want to detect? Well, we've shown that when we add tin to lead telluride, we find that it actually pushes, it makes the band gap narrower, and it pushes our absorption further out. We've shown absorption up to about beyond six microns in that case. So simple thing like addition of tin. And we're looking at addition of other elements as well in order to push it down e even further. I'd like to talk about one specific example. That is the oil and gas industry. Taking away from what um, our earlier keynote speaker mentioned, bringing applications in early when you're trying to do research is a very good thing. And in our group, we tend to do that a lot. We focus a lot on application-oriented research. And in this case, what we did was we actually got the help of our Sloan partners. They run a lab called the Enterprise Management Lab. They went out. They looked at our spiral gas sensors for methane detection. And they said, let's go out and see who in industry might be able to benefit from it, and exactly what do you have to do to make it work for them. So we, we put a lot of value in that research. What we found is pipeline leakage monitoring is a big problem in the oil and gas industry. This is what they told us. There are miles and miles of pipelines. And how do people monitor leaks now? This is how they do it. And it's not, of course, the most efficient way to do it. What is needed for us to penetrate this kind of a market? Well, 
we have to be able to meet this criteria. Can we have a high sensitivity, as uh, Tim Swager pointed out, 10 to 200 ppm? High selectivity, we need to know what gas is leaking. Low false positives, we need to make sure that someone's driving out there to fix a leak that really does exist. It's not a false alarm. And low power consumption, for sure. So if we can meet these criteria, then our sensors can be networked to help solve this problem of pipeline leakage monitoring. And you can see all of our sensors that I've tried to network into this pipeline here. So in answering that first question I asked, got sensor, all of you raised your hands, and of course, all of us who have cell phones do. But I'd like to go one step further and say definitely got integrated photonic sensors. Thanks. 